been doing some retrospect of the first six months this year, looking at things of what's been working, what's not been working, what is different, comparing mm -hmm. that to last year at the same time, really looking at things up and down, sideways, um, seeing what trends we're seeing out there so we could share that. So I would like, just as we're waiting on Amy, I thought this would be a great way we could start off. And just so you guys know, hey, we're here, we're going to get started. Um, she'll be popping in in just a second. And uh, chat, chat feature is below, Q&A right there you know yep. feel free to reach out anytime we love questions if you're watching this on a recording and you want to see something give us a comment um we would love to hear your feedback yep this is getting and to state be of the end in, and state of the end to win because we will absolutely. be giving away a trip yep um, absolutely but, and anyone who's but, new, well, I, thanks so much I, I was just gonna suggest and and just ask is there anything out there that you all have seen um just to start off with maybe things that you thought you got right that mm -hmm. were better than what you thought they would be or things that yeah. you got wrong that didn't work out so well. Cause that's really what today's, today's topic is, is yeah. what's working, you know, what's working, what's not yeah. working. It's and misses. we know there's going to be some, yeah, you know, there's going to be some stuff where, you know, maybe execution plays a part of it, but for the most part, the trends we see are nationwide. We're literally yeah. seeing them from coast to coast and well, things that are working are working exceptionally well. Two things. One, Jay, I want you to, Amy had a quick tech question. I want you to hit that real quick. But another thing that uh, expanding on what Jason just said about what we're seeing nationwide is some aha things for us is we'll see something work in the state of North Carolina that works in the state of Missouri in the same weekend. Completely disparate organizations have, have nothing to do with each other. But then we'll see that, oh my goodness, these high ticket items are working in the silent auction. Or oh my goodness, this organization in Kentucky did two raffles at different price points and it worked and things of that nature. So we're more, you know, we, we're, we're big believers in not throwing, Jason and I just did a podcast on this yesterday, not throwing good, you know, good revenue generators out the window if they're not working, if they didn't work last year or someone convinced you, oh, you don't need to have a silent auctions, like things like that. We're just sharing all this information because as jason mentioned it's happening nationwide what we're seeing um as soon as we get amy on i, I really have a a particular question for an event that happened that we were texting about yesterday an event that happened two days ago um and they absolutely crushed their their goal and i want to know why you know i want to know like okay what happened yeah. and just like you know you hit every single mark um, I know it's going to be, there's definitely going to be some pre-committed dollars, some outside of the event dollars. Um, there she is. Hey. <laughs> oh, hey, Amy. Uh, how are you? Hey, what's up? Yeah, so we're, we're, already, we're, we're already stacking questions for you. How are yeah, you? Yeah, we're already awesome. doing that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I hate to be late. I, Don't I worry about it. Can't. Well, I got a new computer and I'm in a hotel with bad internet so it's just oh, a bad combination fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fun. well That's the big awesome. question is how's the tournament going so far well it starts today first game at five o'clock oh, oh right fun. on okay, okay cool. good good and you're in atlanta yeah. yep oh, Atlanta. Cool. okay good yeah it's probably really hot huh well it is. hey thanks for coming um mm -hmm. really appreciate it i wanted to get hey, if you don't mind shooting from the hip right away we were texting yesterday about jackie's event and it was in seattle right it was, yep. And and they absolutely crushed it. And so what we wanted to do is just kind of talk to folks about what's working. Okay, these things we do every year, they're still working, but we're making them work better because of this. So let's just get right to it because we just wanted to share what you're seeing at events and, you know, what happens, you know, why they hit lightning in a bottle at that event and absolutely crush their goal to your to your knowledge. Um. So my staff, of course, is fantastic. I so figured that out there. Yes. She did. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a lot of things like with this, this event, it's a vendor driven event. So I think like one of the main reasons for the success is the relationship that's been built over the years. Okay. Um, just, you know, the staff has done a really, really good job establishing a relationship, not only with the the hosting group but also has attended enough to um get to know the guests within yeah. you know that typically attend so i think that relationship building has been um uh, you know key for that event yeah. in a lot of our events yeah. um, i do see a trend 
with our events in general that um, people seem to be more supportive. Okay. Um, we're seeing, except one event that was a unique situation and we, we expected it not to grow, but we're seeing a lot of growth in all of our events. Um, okay. People, you know, keep hearing about the economy and stuff, but people are very, very giving. Um, a post COVID thing we did before COVID, but post COVID obviously is um, we've been somewhat forced to use consignment items and that actually and that this i know this sucks for us really bad man i know i don't want to really like, drag your feet across the fire yeah this is not this is not a um they asked me to come here and plug their company at all but it, legit um we are having a lot of success with being able to use you know a couple consignment items that we can sell multiple times um so every event so in the past we were able to get a lot donated um, yep. And we just aren't seeing that same trend. And when you get something donated, it's great because you make 100% profit. However, you can only sell it one time. Um, and we are finding um, every event that I've attended this year that we had a consignment item that we could sell more than once. Um, it never sells just once. Yeah. So we've been able, we're seeing a big increase in, in our live auction. Our mission drive, we're putting, um, you know, our fund a need or miracle minute or whatever you call it we're really yeah. focusing we've really spent a lot of time kind of um you know conditioning our donors and having conversations ahead of time we, we work hard to have pre-commits so well i'd like to say that it's you know this huge success day of which it is but there's also a lot of work that's taken place on the front end we're really sure. working with our sponsors and our donors to condition them to come in and change um, and this, I'm just going to speak for us. We had a lot of events that um, sponsors would buy a sponsorship and then they just hand out all their tickets yep. to whoever. And so then we end up with a lot of people in the room that think they're coming to a party. So we've spent a lot of time changing the perception of what the event is to, yeah, right. we want you to have fun, but we want you to spend money. So changing that perception is something that we've, we've really focused on. Um, and honestly, awesome. we've started doing little changes as crazy as they sound, but we don't put 10 people at a table anymore. We put eight because we find that people can typically find five or six good money spending people to sit at their table. And then they start giving out tickets to like Joe and his wife that have no intentions of spending the dime. So we're really just filling the tables with, um, eaters and drinkers and not bitter so we've changed to where we put eight seats at a table so i mean it's just a combination of things but overall i mean the trend we're like we're seeing a great trend in in all of our events increasing that was yeah, a really i'm gonna i'm gonna answer. break I some apologize. stuff out i'm gonna, I'm gonna be <laughs> real specific i want to be no, real, no, I think that's, great that's right great. What we we're unpack to do. That. yeah yeah i want to be real specific on on something so because you know we just did a podcast on this a couple of days ago that'll be out Maybe it's this week. I'm not sure. Um, and, and it was just something that really hit me about stop asking for money. Just stop and start inviting people and building relationships. And you talked about that. You said we're really spending time on relationships and, and doing that and, and getting the mission. Because tell me why you think that the peop, the increase that is bearing fruit overall. I mean, in, in, in a general way, you don't have to be real specific you know, on one thing, but just why is that? bearing fruit is it because this wasn't done earlier you people didn't we didn't spend as much time doing it we're refocusing time um you know what i've got a priority? few thoughts but i'd yeah. like to hear yours before i chime in yeah so we did not in here again i'll speak from my team that does just you know events across the country um it was okay get this event over rush 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 events over okay great let's move on to the next one and we really didn't have um, a stewardship plan in place and we really that was one of the big things is we focused on stewardship plans and having touch points throughout the year and when i say building a relationship it can be as simple as sending an update when a new drug gets approved by fda for us um so the relationship it looks different but for us it was we just we were so busy moving on to the next event we had so much that we just we just got to the point where we're just um 
spending more time on that stewardship and have more directed contact. Um, so, I mean, I, it, it was us. We, we just were not, we were just getting caught up in the hustle and bustle and it doesn't, the reality is it doesn't take that long to build those relationships. And it is it's simple touch points. It doesn't have to be like this crazy, you know, you call them every month and have an hour conversation. It is really just touch points. So the Stay return on investment is huge. Yeah. I, I think that's something so that, good. you know, we, we talk about saying thank you seven times for every time you ask them, somebody, every time you mm -hmm. receive something, you know, it's kind of a rule of thumb. We've, we we promote, I think that touch point could be one of those thank yous, you know, because mm -hmm. when you're sharing your mission, you're sharing what's happening, you're sharing new things, you're letting people know this is what your investment's doing. It's like getting a report. Like if I invested yeah. into a, a for-profit company and I gave them, you know, money, I wanted to get reports on what my, how my investment's going. Mm -hmm. I want to know. I want to know what's going on. I want to know, you know, what new business do we have? What improvements are we doing? Tell me some, tell me some good stuff. I want to know my money's being well taken care of. And I don't think that's any different in the nonprofit space. I, I think mm -hmm. that we have this, we've, well, I've got the money now I'm ready to move on. And it's really short sighted because my point, what I was going to say is exactly what you're saying. The people we're seeing have tremendous success right now is not because all of a sudden they've got some you know, the mission's changed. It's the same mission they've had for the last 10 years. They're just executing it and they're communicating it better. And they're spending the time with these donors. And I'm talking about in the top, the top 10% of donors. I'm talking about the top 10% that give 90% of the money, you know, exactly, across the board, yeah. you need to do this because you never know whenever that lady that's been giving you a hundred dollars a year for the last 15 years dies and leaves you $5 million in her will. I, I, that happens. It does mm -hmm. uh, because they're seeing that information, but um, you know, spending that time, I, I want to ask a question. I'm going to keep going because I don't want to slow things down. My next question on this same tact, because you said our fund and need, we really, we're really seeing some great stuff and we're doing these pre-commits. Who are mm -hmm. the first people, if, if anybody, whether it's, you know, anybody here that reaches out and says, Hey, Okay, you're telling me to do this. Who are the first per people I call? So who are the first people that you guys, as a rule, either through your committees, you directly, whatever, reach out to when you're starting to get those pre-commits? So the committee's first, lead by mm -hmm. example. Um, so we ask the, the committee, you know, what, what their giving level is going to be and if they'll commit ahead of time. Um, and then we, um, we pull reports from our software and we look at who were our big donors last year, you know, we, we track all our income. So we look and see, you know, who gave us $50,000 last year. And that's in here again, hopefully we've done what we're supposed to when we've been in contact with them all year. So us reaching out to ask them if they're going to be able to make that same commitment. Um, it's not like we've gone a year and not talked to them because that's bad. Sure. Sure. But yeah, yeah but, so I would say the committee first, and then we look at reports. Who gave us money last year? See, I, I, I think we get exactly the committee, you know, and, and people that have already given you money. I mean, if you go to your biggest sponsors, if you go to your top sponsors, and let's do, I, I'm, I'm making some numbers up, and you tell me if I'm wrong, off, off on this, Amy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna argue to the, argue the fact that they're the most committed to your mission for that event maybe period for the organization. They're your biggest fans. They want to see you succeed. They want this event to succeed. They want to, they don't want to be attached as the top sponsor to, to, a, to a, you know, one that nobody raises their hand when it comes time. They want that to happen. They want it to be successful. Right. Absolutely. And my, my, I, I think some of the first people that you go to, to talk about this, when you're talking like a fund to need, especially getting those uh, pre-commits are those people. Mm -hmm. because number one, they know other people that can raise their hand and raise money. They know who they're going to be bringing They're, mm -hmm. You know, they have a pretty good idea who's going to be there generally. Uh, and they'll yep. look through the list. And, and a lot of times though, I mean, I, there was an event that I helped uh, several years ago and you know, that's who they, we got them to go to the top two uh, sponsors and between the top two sponsors, they gave another $75,000, 75,000. Not 7,500, right. 75,000. And they were both in for, I think between the two of them, they were in for about a hundred already between the two. And they went back to them. One gave 50 and one gave 20. Started there. Yeah. And 
because they're like, we want this to succeed. And what they did was they made these challenge gifts to turn around and, and buy and challenge. And we mixed it all up for the fund to need. And it was uh, exceptional. I mean, it really rocked it. It's awesome. So I, I just, I want to just, I think those are the people that you got to go to. So moving on, moving on to the next thing. So, you know, you talked about the live items. Oh, we've got Amy in two places. That's awesome. Sorry, I'm, I was trying, but it's frozen. So I'll, yeah. I'll stick to it. Oh, um, Sorry. So That's we've got okay. Amy. And, so, you know, Amy, you're talking about, you know, that you're seeing consignment has been working really well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you talked about getting the pre-commits and, and having that stewardship. What's something that just you've been, that you did or you saw and you were like, this sucks. Let's cut this out. We're not doing this anymore. It just, this isn't working. If anything. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, and it goes event by event. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily that it sucks that we're cutting it out, but I would, the one thing that comes to mind is um, we are definitely evaluating like the revenue enhancer portion of our event. Mm -hmm. um, so we know people love revenue enhancers and it does add a fun aspect. Um, but revenue enhancers, we find are two things. One, sometimes it gives people almost an excuse to not spend a lot of money because they buy a $25 bottle of wine in the revenue enhancer and they think they've supported the event. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other piece of it is if you don't have a good committee or somebody that can help you get or whatever, you know, if it's a wine pole or something like that, it, they can be a lot of work for, for a, a very, return. very small. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, those are two things that we're really reevaluating event by event and seeing mm -hmm. now I have an event that a committee member buys all the wine for it. Sure, it's a yeah. no-brainer. Um, and we also price it very high so that, um, but here again, we price it very, very high and we tie like a vacation as a grand prize or something so that we can charge a lot and make money off it and make it worthwhile. Do you think um, that, do you think the price point that you just, that you just used the illustration for at the 25 hours is not high enough and could, you could absolutely substantiate that it should be higher? Um, we've been doing most of our revenue enhancers at a hundred dollars. Perfect. Good. Awesome. For most events. Mm -hmm. Yep. But here again, we add a fun element. I mean, we add, yeah. we add a Vegas trip to it, you know, or sometimes we have somebody that donates a, you know, weekend cabin or something that can be a yeah. prize and we're going to make more off it using it as a prize for the wine than if we put it in the silent auction and Perfect. it's not big enough to be a live auction. So I yeah. think using that, I really, you know what? I'll be honest, we, you know, post COVID, we're so short staffed. Um, and obviously we're, you know, we're trying to build back up. So everybody's got full plates. Yeah. So we really simplified our events. We really focused on best practices and what really works. So um, I can't, I hate but it. That's I not a bad thing. Any, but you yeah, said simple, I can't think of anything effective. That, yeah. But yeah, there has so, been some I mean, nuance. Yeah. I'd say we got rid of all the fluff. Yeah, um, so cool. there's not a lot that I, there's not something that I can be like, oh my gosh, that's the worst thing ever that's been across the board. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, you did bring it. Okay. So you, you did give something though. And this is something that I had this very same conversation with somebody the other day. And I said, you know, they were talking about, and basically it was, well, we want to, you know, we want to give everybody a chance to, to give. And I'm like, a hundred dollars is kind of the break even. Is kind of the break point. Yeah. If you're trying to make stuff available for somebody to give at the $25 and $50 level, then they don't need to be at your event. Then you've got the wrong people. And, right. and I'm going to use your, I'm going to use your word because you, yeah. I've heard you say this before. This is a fundraiser. We want to make it party. fun, but yeah. this is a fundraiser. We're here to raise money. So if that being the case, I, I personally like the $100 break. I think that's phenomenal because I think any less than that, you're just wasting time, quite frankly. Yep. Um, so, so you think other than that, is there maybe something that y'all have adjusted? Maybe you didn't throw it out, but you just said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to make this and make some adjustments that 
from this to this revenue enhancer. Here's the way it's going to go now because we want it to make money. Like, is there a minimum amount of money that you want to make in a, in a revenue enhancer before you'll put it in, put it in place? Before you consider it, yeah. I mean, it's a case by case. If it's here again, if it's the, um, you know, that somebody's donating all the wine for a wine poll or somebody's donating jewelry mm -hmm. for a jewelry poll, then I don't necessarily, we have that minimum, like, well, you know, we want to get a hundred dollars out of it or at some yeah. of our smaller events, $50. Not necessarily. And here again, it goes back to we look at past events, you know, what is a revenue enhancer done in the past? And um, obviously, we want to go up with it. So I mean, I our, you know, we have a lot of smaller events, I wouldn't, we I probably wouldn't touch a, a revenue enhancer if it was going to bring in less than like $2,500. Yeah, that's a good that's a good floor i get it absolutely hey, i want to i want to get to yeah, becky had a good question. question i want to get to becky's question but first yeah. i just want to ask the on this topic because i think we can come back to that in just a second becky so we won't we won't forget you yeah i want to ask does anybody else have something that you've seen in this kind of case where maybe you've you know raffles are the ones that i see a lot of you know we're able to see people make a lot of improvement in because they've been doing 25 dollar raffles or maybe 50 dollar raffles and they just said okay we're going to do the hundred and it, you know, more than doubled the amount of money that they were raising. And they saw quite a bit of, you know, enthusiasm with it. Has anybody else seen that? Maybe you've made a change this year? Anybody? Oh, yeah. I want to hear some feedback for sure. Anybody? We're big fans of having, and tell us what you think about this, Amy, because we're seeing it work at a bunch of different events. We're big fans of having multiple buying opportunities of those revenue enhancers, like those different golden tickets or drawings. We've had multiple organizations have success selling a $100 ticket and a $250 ticket. And we're also introducing the never ending raffle where we take an item, sell 50 tickets, draw a winner, and then open it up again and sell another 50 tickets, another 50 tickets, and seeing success there. Um, oh, good. Yeah, Laura's thinking about doing a wine poll. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, we have, you know, used creative, you know, gifts and items as, as the, you know, the winning prize and what have you. It's been really, really fun to see. We're getting some questions here. We've offered, Eileen said, we've offered $100 raffle tickets and then offered bundled discounts. Oh, okay. So if you buy more tickets, gotcha. For, yeah, yeah six for like 500 instead of. I love of, that. I love yep. that. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. I think that's really, really yeah. cool and creative, Eileen. That works great. See, uh, I, I think, you know, the deal you could, yeah, I'm like she's saying, you know, if you do one for a hundred and three for 250, I think that's fine. And if everybody cool did that. it at 250, it's a nominal, you know, the discount's nominal. So you still make significant amount of money. Um, I think those are really good. I want you, I, I want to think though, Eileen, my suggestion yeah. is instead of discounting the dollars, if they buy multiples, just give more more tickets for a higher amount. You know, it's the same thing. It's three for, you know, one for the hundred. Because if you're doing limited, especially, you know, if you've got like, let's say it's five tickets for a hundred bucks and, you know, a wingspan for 250. One thing that for me, what I'm thinking, I want everybody to opt for 250 because they're like, well, that's stupid. It's not, it's not even, it's not fair. I, I want the more tickets. That's the way we want it. Yeah. Cause really all we're wanting to do is to get them to make a choice yep. because if you said, well, you know, it's five tickets for a hundred and 12, you know, 13 tickets for, for 250. It's kind of like, where's my, where's my upside to it? Let's make it easy for so, them to say yes. And choose. Them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Make it really ridiculously. Yeah. Remove the friction. If they say, yep. well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, Hey, this is a fundraiser, not a fair, yep. ra fair raiser. Right. Yep. No. Absolutely. Um, um, you want to get to uh, Becky's original question? Yeah. I want to come back and have, so yeah. when you guys are doing something like where the grand prize drawing or something like that, when do you time that in the event? Um, so we do it towards the end of the event. Okay. We put, um, we typically will have like some pre-printed cute little like tickets or something. And we just write their bidder number on it. Mm -hmm. um, but we put in everything that you must be present to win. Um, right. And that is, helps us keep them through at least the fundraising part of our evening program. Mm -hmm. So that they're there for the, you know, the live auction, the fund to need, whatever. Um, and program. So we, we do it towards the end of the night. Awesome. Hey, that brings up a question. What about timing? Are you guys doing anything difference on difference on your timelines than what you were doing, say last year? Or is it pretty well stayed the same? No, I mean, it's pretty much stayed the same and it, it not hasn't changed since last year, but we did 
change a few years ago where we went more with um, getting the the fundraising we say out of the way before we do the actual what we call the program so instead of spending you know you know when we go in for dinner for the dinner program instead of spending time thanking the committee and thanking all the sponsors and and all that before we do anything we we kind of well, we not kind of we definitely we do a a welcome and a thank you and go right our first speaker which is the speaker that's really gonna lead us into the fund and need or the mission drive um and then we'll go into dinner and then typically what we do is when the last plate is down for dinner um by then your front half of the room that spends is to if you've sat people in the right place that's your money spenders and they're about done eating and that's when we jump right into the live auction so you guys are doing the fund and need first and then mm -hmm. and then doing the live auction i like that yeah Yep. Um, Becky. So, and I'll tell you, Jason, that. the reason we did that is statistics show that only 10% of your room, and this is a, a super, like, there's different methods, and I'm not saying that ours is the best. It's what works for us, but 10% yeah. of your room participates in your live auction. I'd agree with so that. So, when you do your live auction first, and I know auctioneers like to use it as a warm up, and I, I get that. Um, but what happens is the other 90% of the room starts talking and going to the bar and drinking more because they're not part of that. They're not going to bid on those high ticket items and you lose your room. Whereas we can do our mission drive first. Hopefully it's 100% participation and then coming mm -hmm. right out of dinner. Um, we'll do like a warm up item or something. And if you have a good auctioneer that's, you know, does something fun you know, says, okay, everybody find your bidder paddle, raise it high. All right, great. You all just donated a hundred dollars or something fun to get them going um, before they do the live auction. I think mm -hmm. you can, it can have the same effect and you haven't lost your room. Love it. Well, I want to just make a comment and we've got some more questions. I, I want to get some comments on those. Um, you know, I, I do agree with that. And I think that's the point of a live auction. A live auction is you're, we're not trying to appeal to everybody. We're trying to hit, I mean, we want to do something where people maybe have the chance of bidding. That's why we, you know, we like to have the pass out items and things like that, but we're looking for the people that have significant capacity to do that. And that's, who's got the significant capacity. If you're putting stuff out there that, you know, every appeals to everybody and the, the regular deal, your top 10% will not bid. They were not going to because they really don't care. It's not anything that, you know, there, it's just not something that's going to wet their whistle where they're going to raise their hand and bid most, most of the time. So I want you, you know, folks keep that in mind that if that's who you're trying to appeal to in the live auction. Now I would tell you the silent auction, because that brings up the silent auction is different. Silent auction is everybody. Silent auction is, is there to appeal to everybody. However, I want to hear I want before I go down, I'm not going to say anything first. I want to hear what Amy has to say about silent auction, maybe any changes that you guys are doing on that. Um probably the biggest change is we absolutely close our silent auction before um the mission drive, fund and need, and the live auction. Um right. you do hear, you know, you hear people say, well, we need to leave it open longer so that more people can participate. Um, and what we found is more of, there are people that come to an event with a budget, you know, you're, you have your top 10% that are the money spenders and they're going to spend what they're going to spend. And then the rest of the room, they have a, a budget in mind and you run the risk if they're bidding on a bunch of items that they're not going to participate in that fund and need because they don't know what items they want. So we okay. definitely close out our silent auction before we do that. Now, what we make sure we do is it's written into the program. We'll put a countdown clock out up and we have the auctioneer so that we make sure that they know and make it fun. You know, get out your phone two minutes and, you know, you're doing we do everything through text to bid. So it's just everybody's bidding, bidding, bidding. OK, it's closed. Yep. Um, so it almost makes it a little competition. Um, awesome. And we've tried it both ways. And for us, leaving it open longer, I mean, we, and when I say longer, 
we've tried leaving it open through the end of the event and we've tried leaving it open days after the event. And we did not, we did not see that keeping it over open longer increased our revenue. Whereas we have seen less in our mission drive or um, live auction when we don't close it before those. I want to make, I want to just mention this, you know, we're, I haven't looked at it lately. So I, when I say this, this is some old data, but about 80% of all the bids come within like the last, if you're using electronic bidding, I only say sure. this is electronic bidding. If you're using the plain old sheet stuff, who knows what's happening, but electronic bidding, about 80% of the bids come in like the last 15 minutes. For sure. Mm -hmm. It really online is. Auctions I mean, are like that too. Yeah. It, well, we, we've done, we've done some na nationwide online auctions mm -hmm. that hardly anything they, they did five days maybe it was seven i can't remember when we did the, that, last, that one last august it was a very large event national uh, yeah. we were part of it they railed it through and all everything that you know we can sign 12 items into that event every one of them sold and every one of them sold in the last 20 minutes and the reason was it still brought significant amount of money but it's just people wait to that very end and they start bidding at the end. And that's when the, the frenzy gets up and they push the butt, they keep push the button because they're looking at it. I think otherwise they're not looking at it all the time. Yeah. They're just not doing it. That's yeah, I, conditioning so, sure. I don't, I don't think, I think I, if you, I think if you did a silent auction, I think if you ran a silent auction for 30 minutes, I think you would make just as much money in 30 minutes being focused, talking about it, pushing it, you know, and really focus on it than you would if you ran it for a week. So I will tell you that is something that we've we've changed this year is we are really trying to um, get our silent auctions open at least five days before the event. And so we are seeing those few days leading in that gives us a touch point where we can send out the link and like, you know, the, the silent auctions now open. It's just putting us in front of them more. And we are seeing quite a bit of. Um, bidding on silent auctions taking place leading into the event and then like you said it's almost like it stops during the event they're not really paying attention and then as it and, and we always let people know ahead of time approximately when the auction is going to close so then it is dead and then it's yes that last 15 minutes before we're getting ready to close it down is where we see them but overall and it could be a coincidence but overall this year with our events that we open the silent auction ahead of time where people have time to really go in and look at all the items and read the descriptions and stuff. We are seeing an increase in our revenue for our silent auctions at those events. Awesome. I think that's awesome. really good. Yeah. We think it's an underutilized tool right now. That's are you sure. guys putting a, are you guys doing a buy it now price on everything, Amy? Depending on the event, but I would say probably 90% of them, we do a buy it now. Um, we do, it, it, we do look at the items um, and, and see if there's an item that is a hot item, even though it might have a, a fair market value of $200, we typically double or triple. And that's our buy it now price. Mm -hmm. um, if we see an item that maybe the fair market value is $200, but it's really one of those like unique items that not everybody has access to, we are not going to do a buy it now because we and I'll give you an example. We're in, I'm in North Carolina and at our events, UNC and Duke are huge rivals. If you have football tickets, when they play each other and the, the value on those tickets might be $500, you will get people that pay $4,000, $5,000 for those tickets because they can't get them. So items like mm -hmm. that, that we know have the potential to, we don't want to cap it. Um, yeah. So we do kind yeah, of sure. go item by item and look and see, but for, the rest of them, yeah, we we do a buy it now. We have awesome. uh, we're we've been advocating that you put a buy it now on everything. Now, obviously, as a, as a ceiling, I, yeah. as, well as a ceiling. Well, no, I'll just tell you what we we've been advocating is that you, exactly what you're saying that if something is worth, let's just say that you know, let's just say it's some. It doesn't matter whether it's consignment or not. Let's just say it's some a value and it's a couple hundred bucks. Like you said, putting it up there four or five hundred bucks. And not putting the fair market value anywhere. I, I don't, I think that's a, I don't think you need to do that. I think all that does is give people a reason to discount something because they start, you know, they've got a phone, they can look it up. If yeah. We don't, we don't list the fair market value. Good. We list it in 
in our system for tax purposes. Sure, sure. Um, yep, but it's not it. like yep. we're putting. But it's not for marketing. Yeah. Yep. But I, we've been advocating that, and the people that have been doing that have seen significant increase in right. bids, increase in pricing, because it's a little gamesmanship. You know, if yeah. you see something out there and it says five thousand dollars, and you know the bid's twenty five hundred, you go, oh well, you know it's about half price. We've not said that this is what it's worth. We're not saying this is what it's worth. We're not saying this yeah. is the value. This is just a if you want to win it it's right a strategy. now. You want to just yeah. Buy it. yeah, it's a strategy. It's a strategy. Um, yeah. Hey, um, we answered Rebecca's question about participation with the silent in your. Yeah, I in think. Your, yeah, what do you think? Probably, I mean, probably higher participation than ten percent of the audience. I'm assuming. Just to address that, um, yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, right. oh yeah. I think and, it's seventy. I'll, I think it's seventy percent. That's what, what I was just going to say. Sixty-five yeah. to seventy percent. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. we're also going to say we're pretty opinionated. Jason and I are at least. I'm not going to throw you another buzz, Amy. But we're pretty opinionated about not having a bunch of stuff in your silent auction and making it an equal opportunity silent auction where you have. $40 items and you know, this and that and touching all these different practices. We, we would like to have higher, we'd like to see higher value items. Right. That it's going to stimulate more, more bidding, more giving as a result. So that's our take um, on that as well. I tell my staff, it's not a flea market. Very, very good. Very, that's great. And okay. yeah. we, I mean, our preference, we do not put anything in our silent auction with less than a hundred dollar value. Um, now we may take three or four or five, $40, $50 items and put them together yep. and make a package. You know, maybe it's, you know, you have a bunch of gift certificates for some restaurants and things like that. And we'll put them with a hotel stay and make a vacation package or something. Yep. Cool. Um, but yeah, no, we don't do anything. And we really try not to, we really cut back on the number of items we used to do. So we used to use, um, so a bidder number typically is one per couple. Yeah. Um, so we would take and we would do, um, one item per for every, number. well, we would do one for every two. Okay. Bitter okay. Numbers. okay. Um, but now we're more like one for every three. Okay. Um, cool. so if you, if it's a big event and you've got 600 people, we would look at it as, you know, two people per bidder number. So you've got 300 people in attendance to do one for three. We're going to maybe have a hundred items. Gotcha. That's still a lot, though. Yeah. That's a lot. A lot. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. If you have 600 people, you know, we did that for our, you know, like our bigger events. And, and we typically everything sells if yeah. we have the right yeah. items. Yeah. yeah. Now, so here we, on the other side of it, we are we are not going to stay so focused on that we need 100 items that we're just going to get whatever. We still yeah. want to have items that we know are going to sell. So if we have 75 really good items that we know are going to sell, then we're fine with that. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. We've um, been seeing, we've been, this is something that we've seen. I want to see if you've had any experience with this, Amy. This is the first time I've ever seen this where items are bringing more in the silent auction. If they've got the right items, than what are doing in the live auction. Like reserve price wise, like higher reserve price. Well, reserve I mean, no, we're seeing stuff yeah. sell for more in the silent auction. Yeah. Than what's selling in the live auction. Very interesting. Um, we are not seeing that. Are you, um, but are you giving and, people the opportunity to buy items of that high a price point in the silent though? In we are. To we do yeah. have yeah. higher. I, here again, I mean, we've had, we were really having success with selling multiple items at the, in the live auction. Live, I mean, yeah. I, mm -hmm. and I just say that coming off of an event that was, you know, it, it was a $230,000 event. And I think the silent auction, it was a pretty good silent auction, did like 13,000, but the live yep. auction did 39,000. Yep. Yep. So, hey, but want... here again, we were selling, we sold each of our items multiple times in the live auction. So I, ours is probably, I mean, it depends on the event, but I, we're probably leaning more. Well, towards our I, live I don't, I won't know better. that the silent auction and gross dollars brought more than the live, but we saw, you know, we had an event that we worked, we helped some people. They had stuff, they had four items and they, these were our stuff. This is our stuff. Four things sold and the minimum, the lowest bid was $500 more than what the most expensive thing sold in the live auctions. Most expensive thing was 4,900. So you're looking at like net, the net. 
No, I'm Nappy. just saying that they. I'm saying just dollar, dollar, you know, dollar yeah, that the donor paid. Just higher ticket. Item there was a donor who paid fourteen thousand dollars for a villa. Um, wow. it paid fourteen thousand for a villa that you know most expensive. They didn't buy anything to live. They didn't buy a ticket. They didn't. They didn't buy anything else. But they bought a fourteen thousand right. dollar villa. But you know, and there were three other items that sold for over five thousand dollars. And the most expensive thing that sold in the live auction was a dog for forty nine hundred. So I'm just okay. saying that's the just dogs. one example. We've got multiple yeah. that we're seeing that in, you know, where we're seeing stuff that this, you know, the silent auction, the live auction. They're so, you know, they're they're trying to save time, so they don't have as much stuff going on. They're putting more stuff in the, in the silent, and uh, they're selling stuff they never thought they could sell. I'm right. Changing, I'm changing pace here real mm -hmm. quick. Um, Becky mentioned something about the champagne, but doing the champagne auction during the reception, that will be served at the start of dinner. And I think that's a great idea. I actually do think that's a revenue enhancer. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's awesome. Um, we've talked about that on previous episodes, selling champagne or you could shell, sell shots of liquor. I don't know. It depends on the atmosphere, your event, of course. Um, can I oh, share that? Can I share that quick story real quick? Cause you I brought want it you up. To. Yeah, please. So I was at, I, this has been a few years ago, very, very high, big gala, you know, I think the least expensive table was $10,000, brought a whole lot of money. Everything was, it was very formal, all the stuff. They brought out shots of uh, Fireball. Kid you not. Yeah. Shots of Fireball. Sold <laughs> it for, I think it was $100 a table. And I think they sold 30 of them. Yeah, it's awesome. Praise. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you buy a Fireball, you know, it's $5 a gallon. So, I mean, it yeah. was these little deals and they just brought it out. And I, I've always said, you know, I thought it was cool when people did champagne. Yeah, and they'd say, oh, right. how much for that? Yeah, I want yeah. a bottle over here. And it's $500 yeah. a bottle of champagne. You know, get them in the nice moment. Get people, yeah, get people, and you get people going. But I, it, so yeah. if you want to do something that's fun, that doesn't cost a lot of money, you'll be surprised how much you'll make off of silly stuff like that. Because there will be that some yo-yo like Trevor Nelson who will sit there and go, yeah, we'll take one. I love champagne. <laughs> we, so oh, I was talking did, about fire. Um, I was talking about shots of Fireball. Oh, I don't like. Yeah, fireball, you would buy two like bottles. You would buy. Trevor would buy so two bottles champagne, of champagne. Not Fireball. Yeah, yeah, you have never seen me take a shot of Fireball in your life, sir. So, uh, but uh, or a shot. But of you, but you would be matter. the one to do that, just like. But I would do two. So. I would do two bottles yeah. of champagne. No question. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we um. So we did something fun with champagne. We actually we had um for our centerpieces. Uh, we had our kids at camp painted flower pots and then we had um, little cards with like their name and their age or whatever. And we had at each table, the auctioneer had one person stand up and they became the auctioneer to auction off the centerpiece at their mm -hmm. table. Cool. And the table that their centerpiece went for the most, um, we served them champagne at cool. the beginning. I love that. that I love fun. the competitive it, side of that too. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. Yeah. I think adding little things like that can add thousands, obviously, to your event. Becky's speaking of that. Hey, Amy, I know you were referring to um, that event in New York when you were just telling a story. Um, and it was, I was jotting down some ideas when we were scheduling this. And one of the things I know you were saying that the crowd was very, very difficult. And I thought, yeah, and I don't want to, you know, whatever, I don't want to sling mud or whatever like that. But, but I thought the audience could get some value out of you talking about how do you handle that or how do you tell your, how do you implore your staff or the auctioneer or whoever's on board to handle that um, when that happens? Cause it, inevitably at events, it can happen. Right. So. It can. And I mean, this event that you're referring to, I've never, um, and I've been to this event before and it's, it's, always been a, an event where the people in the room I just I don't know they they talk over the MC they and it's not even a situation where as the night goes on and they drink more I mean it is from the get they're just it's just a loud group um, they're a loquacious bunch <laughs> it is and it's yeah. like obviously it's that fine line because I've been in an event where I had an auctioneer like pretty much tell the audience they needed to shut up and that did not go over well yeah. Um, whereas in this situation, the auctioneer handled it fantastic. He just kind of kept doing his thing. I don't know how, but people were still donating during the mission drive, but it did get to the point in that situation. What I did was asked um, the chairman of the committee who happened to 
do this event specifically because he has um, a son with muscular dystrophy. So he's very passionate about the mission and stuff. And it really is a lot of his connections, very respected man, mm -hmm. um, where he got up on stage in the middle of the program and asked people to, to please be quiet and, and let the auctioneer, you know, do his thing. But mm -hmm. with that being said, it was a lesson learned. Um, you know, we had written our script with, you know, descriptions of the live auction item and stuff. Well, we were putting it on the screen at the same time. And so we learned that next year, like we need to go right into the item. We, if we just need to make sure all the information is displayed ahead of time. And the auctioneer is very quick with, this is the event. It's Tuscany, blah, blah, blah boom, go into it, not going into these long descriptions and stuff, having them available. We put them on the inside, typically put them on um, our bid paddles. We use an eight and a half by 11 and put big oh, numbers smart. in it. Yeah. It's folded in half and on the inside is every live auction item with I the description. That's great. Um, so, you know, we'll make adjustments for next year um, yeah. to, to that. But in that situation, I that is my suggestion is one, having conversations with the committee leading into the event to, you know, this is, and they know we did, we do debris shrubbery and they all talked about, you know, how loud it was. And so it's next year reminding them of the situation and asking them to have those conversations with their guests. Um, and then, you know, adjusting the program to keep it quick and just doing what we can to, to make a little adjustments. Yeah. Well, I want to, oh, I want to just, yeah. I want to give you guys some, some, something to think about. And I know, and we kind of had a little talk about that um, with sound. Go to any national football game, go to a basketball game, go to anything. There's nobody there telling the people to be quiet and you can still hear everything that they're saying. It is all a matter of acoustics and sound. And, and when you go in to test the sound and there's no one in the building, it sounds it sound a lot exceptionally different. loud <laughs> yeah. and, and it, it needs to, it needs to almost be, you need to be able to turn it up to where it's almost painful with yeah. nobody there. Because when you put, you know, 600 bodies in the room or 300, however many people you have, they absorb a lot of sound and, and, and that sound starts canceling each other out. So that's just a little insight from my deal. I love that. It's all a matter of volume and you have to have somebody who's got that deal and they know just keep turning up until finally you get everybody's attention and it will happen. I'm telling yeah. you, once you get it up to a certain point, people will pay attention. Well, and, and so, and that's another thing. And this is one thing I've always had a conversation with my staff. Our best practice is not to use the house sound. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you need to hire an external company, AV company and this specific venue. We have always used the house sound and had issues. We did hire an external AV company to come in and he's done events there, but he brought all of this stuff, but he hooked into their speakers. Got so that it. was a lesson learned. He could only go so loud. So that was yeah. like a lesson learned for us. Like next year, he, have the AV company, he's a but he needs to bring his, his own speakers and stuff. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I can't, I can't just, I want to tell everybody just, that is one of the critical reasons because you can out volume people that are talking. You can't get them to stop. 30 years of doing it. I've tried to do that. Everybody repeat after me. Shh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That works once. Yeah. And it works with people who are already going to be respectful and, and they just kind of yeah. got, they just kind of got carried away. Yeah. You can bring them back, but if they're just loud, you got to get loud with them because you can't stop it. You're not going to ever get ahead of it. And if you do no. say something like that, you're going to piss half of them off. <laughs> Yeah, and, you make them mad. Yep. Yeah, they're gonna, and this they're, wasn't they're, even this wasn't like we're at our table like talking amongst ourselves. This was people to, like hollering from table to table having conversation. Like it was crazy to me. Fortunately, they all ran out of drinks about the same time because they weren't spending money and they got up and went out to the bar. We had we did not have the bar in the room, thank God. So they went out in the hallway and good. Then it was fine. Then you locked the which door. Is an, which is another thing that I do encourage. It, based on the event is if you know you have a a group that's really loud like that don't have your bar Nearby. in the room yeah whereas hey, Becky. oh sorry i'm sorry i thought you were done sorry my apologies. no i was gonna say whereas if you have money spenders in a quiet room have your bar inside so they can go get their drink quick and come back cool Love it's that. very strategic. Know <laughs> your crowd. Know your crowd. Yep. Know the atmosphere. Know the culture. Becky hey, wanted Becky. to expand on that the yeah. bitter paddles. Yeah. 
So it's just a simple, we have a template. It's a simple eight and a half by 11. So if you, you know, most auctioneers, they say, you know, they want the big numbers because they're trying to, you know, see from far. So it's um, when you fold it in half, there's um, the big bidder number is on both sides. But when you open it up, it's just, um, it's just a description of each live auction item. And it is everything from the description to the restrictions to the expiration date so that we've put everything in front of them. And oh, we find that when people are sitting at their table eating or whatever, they're opening that, they're reading it, whatever, then they know. And so that allows us when it comes time to um, do the live auction, they essentially mm -hmm. know. Um, but we, so, yeah, we have so, them printed at like Staples or someplace, but, and we have yeah, a template yeah. and it's, it's a thicker, you know, like a card stock. Yeah. But so Becky, you could do it this side and then this side, because all the stuff she's talking about is in the, in the inside. Yeah. So, yep. you know, if that's, if that's, I, I love big numbers cause I can't see, you know, mm -hmm. and back whenever I was still doing it, it, you know, you're sitting there going, can you tell me that number? Yeah. And you know, it's really nice to be able to yeah. go one Oh seven. Yeah. And so I'll tell you a little bit to expand on what, so Jason, how you had that. We put the number obviously right across. Um, Did you, you so do it this way? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then on both sides. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so then the what number on both do, sides this way. Yep. And, and then what we do is because we're fortunate and we have a software system that when you pre-register for our event, it tells you your table number and your bidder number. So you have it. Um, we put labels on each of the bitter, not bitter cards with the person's name, their table number. Um, and then ahead of the event, they, we put the bitter, bitter numbers on their table. We don't give them to them when they check in. Cause we don't do, we do contactless check-in now we do pre-registration. So they don't even get that bid paddle till they go to sit down for their program. So you just put and it at their table, their table. It's already set up. Yeah. And, hey, the, and the question. auctioneer just like makes it a point to say, everybody look, there's your bid number or your yeah. bid paddles, your name's on it. Yep. Do cool. you guys still do a program? You mean Good like question. a, like an event journal type thing? Like a, just a, a program, you know, with a book where you open it up and it's got the sponsorships and got all that stuff. Not if I can help it. Done. There is, there is one or two events where that, and in their defense, it's because they do mail out the leftovers after mm -hmm. to ask for additional. Um, but no, we do everything electronic. We, during our cocktail reception, we do a loop that will have all the same ads that we would have put. Nobody at our events kept them. At the end of the night, I spent half my time going and collecting all the event books that spent a ridiculous amount of time to create and thousands of dollars to print. And they're all laying on the floor, on the table, whatever. So we do everything through our PowerPoint presentation during the event and then, you know, running loop. Um, and nobody at the events where they used to, you know, have to ha get their quarter page ad or full page ad, we have not had a, a single person, to my knowledge, complain or complain. ask for that yeah. back. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm indifferent to it, uh, but I understand exactly where you're coming from. That's for there sure. Are a lot of I, I think I just I think it's a, I think it's I think it's a ways to ways to save money and time. I think a yep. lot of time and money gets spent on it now. Yep. And it's not like it was 20 years ago when you didn't have the oh, overhead Lord. and the videos and all the stuff. And all you know, all this. But you could have digitally. QR code, you know, technology at your you don't, table. I mean, everybody walks around the phone. Yeah, you can exactly. put everything right yeah. here, so you can give it yeah. to them electronically, and they walk around with it anyway. So. Yeah. Um, guys, we got to draw a prize. Any last questions for, um, for Amy before she goes, anybody got a humdinger? Thanks. Hey, thanks. Don't ask a her a ton. humdinger. Thanks a ton <laughs> for taking the time, Amy. Seriously. That's yeah. awesome. Sure. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Laura thanks. Thompson. Thanks. Laura Thompson. You are the winner. Oh, cool. Okay. Everybody nice. give Laura Hi, Thompson. Laura. Good. Congratulations, Laura. All you right, got a trip Laura. that you can use in your next fundraiser. You're a winner, Laura. You are a winner. When you I look and you say, a oh, I'm a winner. Because of this information, everyone was a winner. Just go, when you go get in front of the mirror, you look at yourself and look really deep in your eyes and say, I am a winner because you are. I love it. Yeah, really good. Oh, thank you, Laura. That's fantastic. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. Amy, we hope the tournament goes fantastic. Hope Sam yeah. crushes it. And Her uh, last AAU tournament. Last Ever. one? Oh, uh, yeah. Ever. Oh, really? Oh, geez. Okay. Well, you got college ball. You're yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, hey. Yeah, I found that I time. didn't miss AAU tournaments near as much as I thought I would. Yeah, I probably In fact, not at all. Very time the consuming. Travel, yeah. the crazy yeah. parents, the bad refs. Nah. The bad. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. Oh my god. Hey, everybody, hey. thanks so much. If you yeah. get this, you're going to get a recording with this. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to hit us up. Jason, HJ Fundraising, Trevor, HJFundraising.com. We'll also put Amy on there. She's always so gracious to uh, answer any questions. Thanks for the and, time. And uh, Amy, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate you. Sure. Tell thank Jimmy you guys. hi. So much. Tell Jimmy hi. We saw him walking back, back across yeah, back yeah, there. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> have fun. Have, have fun. fun. We'll see you. Bye, All everybody. Right. Bye, see you guys. next Thursday. Thank Bye, guys. Thank you.